We move to the next lecture, which is um, related to a specific cause of thrombocytopenia in ICU, as I said, DIC and sepsis-associated coagulopathy. Again, my disclosures. So DIC is often the immediate precursor of death. We see it in patients that will um, eventually die very often. And this is why we can say that DIC actually stands for death is coming. DIC means that we have the intravascular activation of coagulation with loss of localization, which can arise from different causes. And here you have the most common underlying diseases predisposing to DIC. As you can see here, sepsis is the first one because it is the most common cause of DIC. And actually somewhere around 30 to 50% of septic patients exhibit at least some features of DIC. Now we have discussed about the physiology of coagulation. So we know that we have in coagulation, we have the clot formation and the clot lysis. So let's imagine this process of DIC as a resultant of two vectors, one of clot formation, of coagulation, and one of clot lysis, of fibrinolysis. If we have, for example, this vector of fibrinolysis very large and very increased, and the vector of coagulation not so well represented, we will barely have the clots formed and they are already lysed. And the patients will be bleeding. And if we run a rotem or a tag, it will look like this, hyperfibrinolysis. This is something that we see often in hematological patients, patients with hematological malignancy. If we have the vector of coagulation large and increased and the vector of fibrinolysis lower, then we will have the clots formed, but they will not be lysed. And we will get, in the end, microthrombosis and organ dysfunction. And this is something that we see in infection. Hypercoagulability is what you see on a tag or a rotem. If we have both vectors very large and increased, so we have coagulation and we have also fibrinolysis, then we will have, of course, the massive consumption of all the coagulation factors and of the platelets. And in the end, the patients will have massive bleeding. And if we run a rotem or a tag, it will look like this, hypocoagulability. This is something that we see after, uh, in bleeding, after major surgery, after trauma, or even after a major obstetric bleeding. If we have these vectors not so well represented, we have some coagulation, we have some uh, clot lysis, but we don't have yet any clinical manifestations of bleeding or thrombosis, then we are in this stage where we have still normal result of viscoelastic tests and the patients are totally asymptomatic. This is the so-called stage of pre-DIC. And actually, this is very difficult to diagnose. This is a very early stage of DIC, and usually it will turn into one of three other types of DIC. It is very important to know that we have several types of DIC in order to have a very accurate and precise diagnosis. Because in all types of DIC, we have the activation of coagulation, in all types. But what is different is the degree of fibrinolysis. And if we base our diagnosis on the measurement of fibrinolytic activity on fibrinolysis products, such as D-dimers or, or fibrin degradation products, then we will miss the diagnosis in this case of DIC with suppressed fibrinolysis and we will only diagnose the other types. So this is why we should base our diagnosis on markers of coagulation activation, because this is present in all types of DIC, such as thrombin antithrombin complexes, such as soluble fibrin, if it is possible from the lab, or you can still look at the platelet counts, because with activation of coagulation, you will always have a decrease in the platelet count. So it is very good to monitor the platelet counts levels in your patients. According to the ISTH, we have two major types of DIC, non-over DIC and over DIC. Non-over DIC means that we have the activation of coagulation, but we don't have yet any clinical manifestations of bleeding or thrombosis. So we have a stressed but still compensated hemostatic system. And actually, we don't see any modification in the standard coagulation test in the rotem. It is the pre-DIC type, asymptomatic type that I have showed you. Over DIC means that we already have clinical manifestations of bleeding or thrombosis, 
or even both in the same patient. And we have also the modification of the standard coagulation tests and thrombocytopenia. And in order to diagnose this, we have some scoring systems from the ISTH. This is the scoring system for over the IC. And as you can see, it begins with a very important question. Does the patient have an underlying disorder known to be associated with DIC? If we answer yes, it is recommended to do the scoring system. If we answer no to this question, no associated disease, it is not recommended to do uh, the scoring system because we might have a false DIC diagnosis and the patients might have something else. The scoring system for non-over DIC is a little bit more complicated. As I said, it is more complica complicated to diagnose this because it takes into account not only one value of the hemostatic markers, but the trend over time of the results. And also we have some criteria including the measurement of anticoagulant factors. It is very important, uh, depending on the underlying pathology, to choose the right DIC scoring system. For example, we have the scoring system from the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, which is appropriate to be used in patients with hematological malignancy, hematological DIC. The scoring system for, from the ISTH is good for all types of DIC, but the problem is that the sensitivity is not so good. The specificity is good, but it is not very sensitive, so we might miss the diagnosis in some patients. And we have Japanese Association of Acute Medicine, JAAM, scoring system, which is appropriate to be used in patients with infection-associated DIC, with sepsis. And as you can see, it includes here Sears score. As we know, Sears was removed from the sepsis-3 definition, and this is why, since two years ago, we have now another score designed to fit the sepsis-3 definition, and this is sepsis-induced coagulopathy score. This is a very easy score. Actually, it identifies patients having a stage earlier than DIC, and this score includes the platelet count, the prothrombin time, and the SOFA score. Three main elements. And this is very easy to perform in every of your patients. And it was demonstrated that it is similar with uh, JAAM DIC scoring system as sensitivity. So it identifies almost the same patients. As I said, sepsis is the most common cause of DIC. And almost in all the septic patients, we have some hemostatic abnormality. Either we can have only the small modification in coagulation tests, but in some patients we see uh, bleeding, thrombosis, and we see DIC. So we can look at this sepsis pathology as a prototype of DIC. And now we have this uh, increasing evidence uh, in medical literature showing clearly that we have an extensive crosstalk between inflammation and coagulation. And not only that inflammation triggers and activates coagulation, but coagulation, once activated, will increase the inflammatory response. And when they will become like uncontrolled and excessive, they will lead in the end to endothelial dysfunction, to ischemia, to organ dysfunction, and to death. Normally, as I said in the previous lecture, cells that express tissue factor are not in contact with blood because otherwise we will have coagulation activated all over the place. These cells are found underneath the vascular wall and will, in normal people will be exposed to blood flow only when we have a lesion. However, in sepsis or in other states with high inflammation, under the effect of cytokines, we have circulating cells like monocytes and endothelial cells expressing tissue factor on their surface, and this comes in contact with blood, leading to the coagulation activation, thrombin generation, and fibrin formation. Not only this, but under the effect of cytokines, the endothelial cells will express on their surface adhesive substances, leading to increased platelet adhesion and leukocyte rolling, and leading to endothelial dysfunction and activation. Now, coagulopathy in sepsis is not only due to the activation of coagulation. This is the most important, of course, but this is sustained and it is helped by the concomitant decrease in anticoagulant mechanisms and a concomitant decrease in fibrinolysis. So all of these three together will lead to endothelial dysfunction and to organ dysfunction in sepsis. As I said, not only 
inflammation increases coagulation, but coagulation, once activated, increases inflammation. And this is a study, very simple study, performed more than 15 years ago in healthy volunteers which received recombinant activated factor 7. And they measured the level of cytokines after giving this and they found out that we have an increase in inflammatory cytokines after the coagulation was activated by this factor 7. What is the explanation? The explanation is within these receptors, protease-activated receptors, which are found on inflammatory cells. And these receptors are activated by uh, coagulation factors and will lead to the increased formation of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. So we have a bi-directional relationship between inflammation and coagulation. Not until long time ago, this coagulation activation was seen as detrimental because we have the limiting of blood flow to the organs. However, recent research demonstrated that this coagulation activation is actually useful for immune defense, and this is called immunothrombosis. How is this possible? It seems that the formation of the blood clots will help to contain the microbes inside and will limit the microbe dissemination into the body. Also, it seems that if we have these blood clots formed inside the body, these microbes will not be able to enter and get out of the blood vessels so easily. Also, the components of the blood clots serve to recruit at the site of infection uh, cells like macrophages, like neutrophils, and will improve the process of immune defense against the microbes. And also, um, what is uh, very interesting, it seems that even intravascular clots formation is good because it will realize some compartments inside the blood vessels. And in these compartments, the concentration of antimicrobial peptides will be increased and will help to better destroy the microbes. So this is immunothrombosis. So in the end, this coagulation activation in sepsis is very important and can either lead to pathogen clearance and a good outcome of the patient, either if it is too exaggerated can lead to secondary tissue damage and organ dysfunction. So as I said at the beginning, immunothrombosis is good. If it is overwhelming and gets out of control, it will turn out to DIC and the patient will get organ dysfunction. What would be really good would be if we could find exactly this moment when coagulation activation becomes detrimental from a beneficial process. Because this is the moment when we have to stop it. This is the moment when we have to give anticoagulant treatments in order to stop the coagulation activation. This is the therapeutic window. Now, if we move from the bench to the bedside, the question is how to identify this therapeutic window and then if we know when, then we should know what to give to our patients and in which patients. Let's start by trying to answer the first question. How do we find this therapeutic window? Can we turn to standard coagulation tests in order to see this? Actually, the answer would be no, because as we discussed before, standard coagulation tests are prolonged not only in septic patients, but in general in critically ill patients. And also in sepsis, as you can see from this study, compared to control subjects, septic patients have a prolongation of standard coagulation tests. And they have this because they have a decrease in the level of coagulation factors, majority of them, except for factor 8 and for fibrinogen. But this decrease is not so important to compromise hemostasis. As you can see, the levels are not lower than 30%, but still, they are a little bit low and they delay the initiation of coagulation. If we measure the amount of thrombin which is generated by septic patients and by control, and this is thrombin generation tests, the amount of thrombin is the area under the curve, controls, dotted line, septic, full line, the amount of thrombin which is generated is the same or can be even higher in some septic patients compared to controls. But it is produced a little bit later. We have a delay in the initiation, but once it is activated, we have the same amount of thrombin which is generated. So the answer is no. We cannot have uh, our therapeutic window by identified by standard coagulation tests. What about Rotem? 
This is a study comparing the results of standard coagulation test and ROTEM in controls, healthy controls, patients with sepsis without DIC, patients with sepsis with DIC. And it seems that if we do a ROTEM in such patients, we can identify patients with sepsis and DIC because they have hypocoagulability, low clot firmness compared to controls, while septic patients without DIC have hypercoagulability. So viscoelastic tests can help us to identify patients with overt DIC. Which parameters are most useful from ROTEM? This is a study published earlier this year, uh, cannot be seen here the year. And by measuring and looking at the area under the rock curve, they showed that the most useful parameters from ROTEM to identify sepsis-induced DIC is alpha angle and maximum clot firmness. If we combined combine this with the results of different measurements, such as protein C measurement, antithrombin measurement, we also obtain a higher sensitivity. So these parameters are the ones that we should look at. So in the end, if we do a ROTEM or a TEG in a septic patient, we can obtain two different results. Hypercoagulability, if we perform the test very early after we have the initial activation of coagulation and in the stage of microvascular thrombosis. Or if we wait a little bit more after the consumption of clotting factors already took place, we can see hypocoagulability. Our therapeutic window is here. After we have the initiation of coagulation activation, the process of immunothrombosis already took place, but before we have the decrease in uh, clot firmness and the decrease in the clotting factors because otherwise if we wait too long and we give the treatment here, the patients will be bleeding. Now, to answer to the second question, what is the treatment that we should give? We all know about recombinant activated protein C. This is the most well-known treatment for sepsis-induced DIC, Xygris or Drotrecogen Alpha. And we know that activated protein C has no uh, has anticoagulant functions, but also has pro-fibrinolytic and anti-inflammatory functions. And this is the PROVES study, published in 2001, demonstrating that mortality was decreased in septic patients that received Xygris. And actually, this study was stopped for efficacy after inclusion of almost 1,700 patients. And after this study, Xygris was approved to be used in patients with sepsis-induced DIC, sepsis-induced organ dysfunction, and Avacha 2 of at least 24. Until 2012, when Proves shock study was published, and in this study they included patients with septic shock, but this time they did not find the same benefit in mortality in patients that received Xygris, but on the contrary, they found increased bleeding risk. So after this study, after 2012, the manufacturer decided to take off from the market this drug, so we don't have it anymore. But we don't know yet if it is still a closed chapter because studies were continued to be published showing beneficial effects of this activated protein C. For example, the study from Dino, taking also patients from Proves uh, study, showed that by selecting patients with sepsis-induced DIC only, mortality was even more decreased compared to the whole group of septic patients. Also, other studies show that activated protein C can improve microcirculation in patients with sepsis and also can improve the resolution of DIC compared to heparin. But the problem is that we don't have any more this substance on the market. So let's move to another treatment that is tested in sepsis, and this is antithrombin. We know that antithrombin has anticoagulant functions and also other beneficial functions, such as anti-inflammatory function, but the most important is endothelial cell protection because antithrombin binds and stabilizes the glucosaminoglycans layer on the surface of endothelial cells. Antithrombin was tested in sepsis, and this is the Kybercept trial, more than 2,000 patients with sepsis, and they gave in some patients antithrombin, in some they did not give, and they looked at mortality at 28 days. The result showed no difference in survival. 
However, if they looked only at the patients who did not receive concomitant heparin for a reason or another, they could see that actually the use of antithrombin was associated with a better survival. So this is why they selected only these patients and included in another analysis, and they found out that actually antithrombin was good for improving mortality in patients without concomitant heparin and DIC, but not in patients without DIC. What is the explanation? Why only in patients that do not receive concomitant heparin? Actually, as I said, the beneficial effects of antithrombin are because of endothelial cell protection, because they bind to glucosaminoglycans and have the role of protecting the endothelium. Once we give heparin, a lot of this antithrombin will move to the liquid phase and will bind to heparin and will no longer be available for this role of endothelial cells protection. So this is why antithrombin should not be given together with heparin because we lose the beneficial effects. However, a Cochrane review uh, evaluating the efficiency of antithrombin in sepsis did not find any beneficial effects, but the problem is that uh, more than um, half of these patients were from the Kybercept trial and uh, were not selected patients with sepsis and DIC, but sepsis patients in general. Thrombomodulin is another treatment that was tested in sepsis, and this is a very actual topic now, a very debated topic. Thrombomodulin, as we know, has anticoagulant functions, but also anti-inflammatory functions, and also protecting the endothelial cells. And thrombomodulin was tested in this study by Jean-Louis Vincent, including septic patients with suspected DIC, randomized to receive thrombomodulin or placebo, and they looked at, again, 28-day mortality. No difference in mortality, only a non-significant one. But the problem is that once we look back at the data, we see that only a small amount of these patients had overt DIC, even if the intention was to select patients with suspected DIC. So this study has a very important selection bias. This is why another study, which was published this year, the SCARLET trial, try to look again at patients with sepsis, and this time with sepsis-associated coagulopathy, defined by this, receiving recombinant thrombomodulin. And they looked again at the same endpoint, 28-day mortality. Again, no difference in survival. What is the explanation? The explanation is that in this study, they made a huge mistake. They included the patients having sepsis-associated coagulopathy, but they allowed a time interval from patient inclusion until thrombomodulin administration of 40 hours. So at the moment when patients actually received thrombomodulin, many of those patients did not have any more sepsis-associated coagulopathy. So this is why the SCARLET trial failed. And now they have undergoing SCARLET-2 trial in which they restricted this interval between patient inclusion and thrombomodulin administration to less than eight hours, if I'm not wrong. This is a meta-analysis that included only patients that at the moment of thrombomodulin administration had sepsis-induced DIC. And according to this meta-analysis, if we look only at these patients, thrombomodulin has beneficial effects on mortality. But it depends very much on what patients you include, how you include them, and for us as readers, we should know how to interpret the results of this study. The problem is that we don't have in our hospital thrombomodulin, antithrombin. What do we have in our hands? For example, we have heparin. And it was demonstrated in several trials that the use of heparin was associated with a better survival in septic patients. And the risk of bleeding was not increased. The question is which type of heparin we should prefer. We should give low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin in our patients. And there are not so many studies to assess this question. This is the HALO pilot trial. Uh, the study is still um, analyzing the data, not recruiting patients anymore, but we have the data only available from day one and two, 
And in this study, they included septic shock patients randomized to receive unfractionated heparin or daltepharin, and they looked at different uh, hemostatic parameters after this. And it seems that the use of unfractionated heparin, which is in white, improves clot lysis time, improves protein C levels, and decreases thrombin generation compared to daltepharin. But this is only from the pilot trial. What is the explanation? Why is this heparin working better than low molecular weight heparin? Because not only the anticoagulant function is beneficial, but also it seems that heparin has more functions like inhibiting cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, inhibiting uh, the adhesion of cells to endothelial cells, and in the end protecting the glycocalyx. What do the guidelines say? This is the Japanese guidelines which recommend that we should necessarily evaluate the coagulation and fibrinolytic status of our septic patients. We should guide the decision to start treatment by JAAM score because this is their score, the Japanese score. And regarding the treatment, they don't make any clear recommendation for thrombomodulin because the SCARLET trial was still undergoing at the moment when these were published, but they recommend the use of antithrombin in patients with sepsis-induced DIC and low antithrombin activity. So this is a very important recommendation, and they use it in Japan. Our guidelines, European guidelines, they recommend against antithrombin, and they make no recommendations regarding heparin or thrombomodulin. So we have basically no guidance. These are the most recent guidelines according to the ASTH published one month ago, and they recommend that we should use heparin in therapeutic doses in patients with coagulopathy and sepsis to avoid progression to DIC. They make the recommendations to use better low molecular weight heparin and no unfractionated heparin, but this is a very low level of evidence recommendation. They acknowledge that the Japanese use antithrombin, and they acknowledge also that thrombomodulin might become a potential treatment for sepsis-induced DIC. And this is a very important statement from a big organization such as ISTH. And now to answer the, sec the last question, in which patients we need to give this treatment? And in order to answer to this question, we look to a very large registry from Japan, almost um, more than 2,500 patients. Half of them received anticoagulant, half of them did not receive anticoagulant. And it seems that the anticoagulant use was associated with better survival in patients with DIC, according to the ISTH or Japanese criteria, and in patients with high severity, so far score between 13 and 17. So this should be our target, patients with sepsis, with DIC, and high disease severity. In these patients, we should give, at the appropriate moment, anticoagulant treatment. This is an algorithm. If you have sepsis with thrombocytopenia, first of all, you look at sepsis-induced coagulopathy, which is a very simple score. If you have sepsis-induced coagulopathy, in order to avoid progression to DIC, you start with anticoagulant treatment. So I think there is a place for a specific treatment of sepsis-induced DIC, but we have to respect very important things, such as timing. We have to respect this initial activation of coagulation and the process of immunothrombosis because it helps for immune defense. We have to have a good target to include patients with sepsis-induced DIC and high disease severity. And we need to have an adequate treatment. Replacement of natural anticoagulants, such as antithrombin, such as thrombomodulin, or we should look at substances which are capable to limit the interaction between inflammation and coagulation. But this is still undergoing research. But what we know for sure that this treatment has to be individualized and adjusted. Thank you. <laughs>